Church, it's an exciting morning as we will begin today a new series studying the book of Jonah. I've entitled the series simply Jonah's Journey, and he definitely went on a journey with God, and it's something that we're going to look at in detail, and I think in doing so, it's going to help us understand how to look at our own heart and our own obedience to God. Today, my goal will be to give an overview and engage our hearts in order to engage God's truth personally. And so we will talk about some generalities about the book. We'll talk about its focus, um, what its purpose is, and why we can learn from it. I've entitled the message, The Character and Activity of God. The Character and Activity of God. Now, I don't know about you, but... One of the things that I can relate to in regards to Jonah's story is the fact that he ran from God. God was working in my life for a number of years, uh, through my college years, calling me to what we call full-time ministry. And I knew that call began when I was uh, attending college in Florida. I was attending a church service where Jack Graham was preaching. He preached on Isaiah Uh, chapter 40, and it was in that text, not that it had anything specific to do with my calling, but God began to stir in my heart a call to ministry, a call to train, a call to return back home and go to school where I did not want to go to school, and the fact I didn't want to go back home, but it was so clear, it was so moving to me that I could not get away from it. And so I said, Lord, this is in time of private prayer, I said, Lord, if you want me to return, I will. And that was a big thing for me personally. That may not mean much to you, but it meant something to me. And so I made all the decisions I needed to make and all the changes I needed to make to return home. And I did. I moved back in with my parents. I continued on with my education at Liberty University as I worked on a degree in accounting. Now you say, how are you working on a degree in accounting if God's calling you to ministry? Well, that's the whole point. I was working to do what I wanted to do, not what God was calling me to do. But I did begin to serve in churches. I began a a time of serving in a local church as a student minister and moved from that church to another church later on uh, during my time in college. So I was serving the Lord and then finishing my degree, beginning to pursue uh, a business um, with Richmond and Georgia Rack Industries as I traveled with them in business, using my degree in accounting because the Lord had shut the door in other pursuits that I was interested in, I said, I'll take this one. And I began to serve the Lord that way. Um, At least I thought I was. But I wasn't serving the Lord. I was running from the Lord. And as I traveled back and forth between Richmond, Virginia, and Atlanta, Georgia, uh, traveling with the owner of the company, staying in hotels, various places, carrying out the business Uh, that I was asked to carry out, the Lord began to make me miserable. Jonah was swallowed by a well, a great fish large enough to swallow him. It was in the belly of the well, and we'll see this, he became miserable. Well, I wasn't swallowed by a great fish, but I was definitely miserable staying in hotel rooms all up and down the East Coast. And I would ask myself, Mark, what are you doing? I was making good money. I had a career path. I landed a job a lot of people would have wanted, but I was absolutely miserable in my heart, and I couldn't find peace. But I kept running, and I kept running, and God made me miserable and more miserable. And so that first year out of college, I simply was miserable in my heart, no matter what I did. I began to go around and ask people, what does it mean to be called a full-time ministry? I'd ask my parents that question. I went down the street and asked a pastor, local pastor, what does it mean to be called to full-time ministry? And people would ask me, say, why are you asking? And I said, I don't know. I'm not called, but I'm just interested. And anytime anybody starts to ask that, you know God's working in their life. And so finally, finally, I can remember the day exactly where I was sitting on the front porch of my house there in Virginia. And I was just sitting there on the front porch, had my head down, my elbows on my knee, and I just said, Lord, opened up my hands and I said, okay, I'll do whatever it is you want me to do, whatever that means. My greatest fear 
was that the Lord would ask me to go back to school for another four years and do seminary work. Did y'all hear Damon say, oh my, or he says something up here like that. Amen. Oh, amen, so let it be, okay? I think I said, oh my, the Lord calls me to go. But that was my greatest fear. I just finished a degree in accounting that I felt like was very hard, and I, I was just too immature to even see why I would go. But the Lord says, no, I want you to go. And so when I finally surrendered at that moment, I had a peace like I can't even begin to explain to you. And if you've never gone through this, you may not understand what I'm saying, but outside of my salvation experience, that surrender to say, Lord, I will do whatever it is you want me to do, brought the greatest peace that money could never buy. There's not a job out there that could fill me, fulfill me in that way. I began a journey of searching to do the greatest thing I did not want to do, and that was to go back to school. I went and looked at several schools to go to, went and visited several schools, but the Lord opened the door for me to go to Southwestern Baptist Theological Seminary in Texas. Never lived in Texas. I had visited Texas. That was a long way. That was a big move for me. It was a big move for my family. But I sold everything I owned, my car, my possessions, every, literally everything I owned down to a, a bag and a briefcase, and I got on a plane, and I went to Texas out of obedience to the Lord. But all I can tell you is, I know that's where God wanted me, and I had a peace in my heart. But the fear of what God was calling me to was absolutely overwhelming. Now, you may or may not have ever experienced anything like this, but I am telling you what happened, and that's a very, probably a very minimal illustration compared to what Jonah was going through and what God called him to do. But that's, my, that's the closest I can come personally to relating to what it is that Jonah went through in this, in this book, in this letter that we're going to study in detail. And I believe that the book of Jonah is so relevant to you and to me personally, that we need to take in every aspect of it. It did say, as Alan was reading in Jonah chapter 1, verse 1 and 2, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come up before me. Now that's how the the book begins, and we'll look at those verses very specifically next week. But I simply want to introduce that to you, and in the next verse it says that Jonah ran from God. You say, how, just two, two little verses? That's all it took and then Jonah ran? Yes. And sometimes that's all it takes for you is that God impresses something on, his, on your heart that he wants you to be obedient to and you simply say, no way, and you run the other way. That we must overcome. That we must repent of. And that is the work of God in our lives. And just as God worked in Jonah's life at that time, I know that he still works today in our hearts. And he calls us to his work and to his activity. And the real question is, will we join him? When Jonah obeyed God and he joined God in his work, lives were changed. God's word went out and it worked in a miraculous way. And Jonah got to be a part of it. And this is where we see in Matthew chapter 12, verses 38 through 41, these significant verses, the very words of Jesus in reference to Jonah, when we see in the New Testament period that there were the Pharisees and teachers of the law that said to him, teacher, we want to see a miraculous sign from you. They were trying to put him on the hot seat and say, prove that you're the Messiah. Do another miracle. Impress us some more. But he said to them, it's a wicked and adulterous generation that asks for a miraculous sign, but none will be given it except the sign of the prophet Jonah. Now, the reason reason I'm reading this New Testament reference that Jesus gives to Jonah is it's significant. It says, for Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the huge fish, so the Son of Man will be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh will stand up at judgment with this generation and condemn it. For they repented at the preaching of Jonah, and now one greater than Jonah is here. The religious leaders did not want to change 
So what they did was they refused to believe. Jonah was assigned to the people. They wouldn't get another miracle from Jesus, but he pointed them to Jonah. Why? Because Jonah was assigned to the people of Nineveh that he had experienced in this great fish death, burial, and resurrection. And Jesus said, that's the only sign I'm going to give you is death, burial, and resurrection. See, there was no question among the religious leaders that Jesus died, and he did. He died on the cross. He was buried. That was not the question. The, the question at hand was, how can he be raised from the dead? No one's overcome death. This is impossible. This is a myth. This is a farce. This is a story that's been made up. This can't be. But yet, as we studied in Acts chapter 1, just recently, that Jesus gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. And that's what they were convinced of was the resurrection, right? And, and, and if you're convinced of the resurrection, and you know that that is true, and we looked at that not just in Scripture, but personally, the evidence that we know Jesus is alive, it is the basis for the proclamation of the gospel. And that's what happened then in Acts 2 through 7. The Holy Spirit gave to the nation of Israel abundant witness that Jesus was alive. And that is the only sign they needed. So the main lesson here is simply this, that the citizens of Nineveh will be a witness against the rulers of Israel, for they did not repent when Jesus gave them the truth. But, but those in Nineveh did repent at Jonah's preaching. See, what this states is simply this. It's all about believing or not believing. And the question is, do we believe? Do we believe enough to proclaim the gospel message? Did Jonah believe God enough to trust him with what God was calling him to do? This is all about us believing God so that God through us can ask other people to believe. And it's all based in the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the gospel message is. But the problem with believing is, one of the great challenges is, you and I, we don't like to change. There are things that challenge our hearts that say, I'm not sure I want to change. When God was calling me into ministry, I'm not sure I wanted that life. I'm not sure I wanted to go back to school. I had fears about that. I had, I had things that I didn't want. I, I, had other, I had other plans. But God said, this is what I want you to do. Am I willing to die to my plans and accept God's will and walk in that? I'm not so sure that we like a God who changes things in our lives to accomplish his will. I'm just being honest with you. Most of us don't like change. Most of us don't think we ought to have to change our lives to accomplish the will of God. But God is a God who works in such a way as he says, there's got to be some change in order for me to accomplish my will. How many of us like to eat at the same place at the same time, the same meal? We don't like to try new restaurants. Different types of food at different times. How many of you struggle with change? You be honest with it. Tell me, okay, all right. I think that's a pretty natural thing. I don't think that's like a, I'm not, I'm not, I don't think that's like a heart of rebellion. I think that's just human nature. We get in a routine and we like it the way we like it. But what I found is God has a way of saying, what you like, I don't need. Here's what I want you to do. And we don't always like that. Let me ask you a couple of questions for you to give consideration to. Do you fear what God may ask you to do for him? I know I did. Do you fear that? Think about that for a second. Do you fear what God may actually ask you to do? I think it's pretty common. But I think it's a real thing we must address. Do you fear God may ask you to change your life in a way you're unwilling to change it? He may ask you to move. He may ask you to develop new relationships. He may ask you to, for me, go to school. He may ask you to teach a class. He may ask you to go somewhere and minister in a part of the world you've never ministered in. He may ask you to go across the street and minister to somebody you literally 
cannot get along with, but yet God's going to call you to do it. You say, is that even biblical? Yes, it's biblical. Guess what? God asked Jonah to go where? To his greatest enemy and preach the truth. Could God ask you to do that? Yes. Are you okay with that? I don't know if you are. I know there's been times I'm not okay with it, but I say, oh, God, okay, if that's what you want, I'll do it. Do you fear God may ask you to engage people or a place you're not familiar with? Do you know what xenophobia is? Xenophobia is derived, xena is derived from the Greek word xenos, meaning foreigner or stranger. Phobias, you know what that means. It means a morbid fear. So xenophobia is the irrational fear experienced about a person or a group of persons as well as situations that are perceived as strange or foreign. Xenophobia is a real thing. It affect, affects you physically, the fear of the unknown. It is characterized by many physical and emotional symptoms like rapid heart rate, palpitations, dry mouth, uh, shallow breathing, full-blown panic attacks. The thought of the unknown literally triggers that in people. The feeling of being anxious, trying to run away, avoid the situation that requires change, crying, shaking, trembling, throwing up, fainting. Every one of those things is connected to xenophobia, which simply means we're scared about the fear of the unknown. And it's real. The fear of the unknown is so frightening to us. See, here's the thing is, the reason this is so relevant to us is the challenge is when it comes to God, we like a God who is predictable and safe. We like a God who does things our way, not his way. We don't like things that require faith and trust. You and I are creatures of habit and safety. Did you know that? We really do like to play it safe. But that's not who God is. Our God is a living God. Our God is a God who is on mission. Our God is a God that says, trust me. Our God is a God that says, you must have faith in me that I know what is best. And when God is working and moving and inviting us to be a part, if we are full of fear, we can never join him in what he's doing. That's personally as a church as a whole. And it speaks to the very nature of who we are as human beings. You say, well, how in the world do we overcome such a thing? Well, the good news is all of it can be overcome. In fact, in studying the book of Jonah, you can overcome some of your greatest fears. Did you know that? You say, how can I overcome my fear of talking to other people? How do I overcome my fear of being put in situations I'm not comfortable with? How do I overcome my fear of proclaiming the gospel message to someone else? How do I do that? And my answer to you is this, and I've learned this myself, is that we can overcome when we understand that God is trustworthy. It's all about his activity and his character. And that's what I want to be clear about with you. That's what it's about. That's how you overcome. You can trust him. He is trustworthy. You learn to trust God anew. And that's one of the things studying the book of Jonah will do. It'll call us to trust God anew. As a parent, I remember just thinking back I was, as I was working on this, that how I've learned to trust God and he brings me through things. As a parent raising three children, there were times the role of a parent is to help a child trust you. That's how they overcome fear. You say, what kind of fears? Well, they're standing on the bed, right? And you say, well, jump. And they go, I'm scared. Jump anyway. I'll catch you. And so what they're doing is they're trusting your character they're trusting your word, and they jump off the bed into your arms, and they trust that you're going to keep them safe. What God says to you and me is, trust me. My character is trustworthy. Do you believe God's character is trustworthy? I help my child across a stream. I help my child overcome the fear of darkness. I used to tell my children, you don't need to be afraid of the dark. And I walk them through that. And I, and I do some things to try to help them understand they don't have to be fear, fearful of what's in the dark. 
And, and so my point is simply this. As a parent, we do that all the time. And, and what I want to say to you, God's doing that all the time with us. Please trust me. My character is trustworthy. So if we're clear, we should know that Jonah is about the character and the activity of God. Hey, when I say the word vacation, what comes to your mind? Some vacation that you love, some place you love to go. When I say the word love, what comes to your mind? A person that you love? When I say the word Jonah, what comes to your mind? Well, that's probably the, 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 the first thing that comes to people's mind. We think about Jonah and the well. Did you know the well is only one of many things that should be considered in the book of Jonah? It is only one of many tools in the bigger picture of God's work in the world. This book is not simply about a well. <laughs> And it's not about Jonah specifically running. It's about more than that. It is about the character and the activity of God. And if you're interested in the character of God, if you're interested in the activity of God and how God is working, you're going to be so enthralled with the book of Jonah that you're going to read it over and over and over again, and God's going to show you things about himself, and that makes it worth the time and the effort. It's a beautiful thing. It reveals the character and activity of God in the life of an individual by the name of Jonah. It reveals the character and activity of God in the lives of an entire nation, the Assyrians. One of the great moves of God. What an amazing thing that is. Each chapter reveals the character and activity of God and reveals truth about humanity. When you look at all four chapters, yes, we see Jonah running, sinking, praying, going and preaching, and even fuming at the end. But it's an incredible study. And I want to give you today five compelling reasons why we should be excited about studying the book of Jonah. And here they are. Reason number one, to overcome being fearful of God. Did you know if we were honest that most people are fearful of what God's going to ask them to do? And we don't know how to handle that. Just as Jonah was fearful of God's call, so the church today is fearful of God's call. It has been said that Jonah is one of the most relevant books addressing the church's spiritual condition today. It's one of fear. It's one of not trusting God. See, when we allow fear to control our hearts, we flee. The call of God. We don't pursue the call of God. And if we can overcome any measure of that in your heart and my heart, our hearts as a whole, as a church, we can know God's will, we can walk in God's will, we can fulfill God's will. And man, what a victory that is. But too often we talk a good game, but like Jonah, we're fleeing the presence of God. We're fearful of what he may ask us to do, and we're not sure we want to do it. And in many ways, the church, listen, listen to what I'm going to say here because I believe it is true. In many ways, we have been in full retreat of the will of God when it comes to preaching the message that has been given to us. Now, we have spent many weeks studying about how, how to share the gospel just like Jesus did. The fact that we've been called and commissioned to do that, that we are ambassadors. We cannot get away from that. We will be held accountable to that message. But the problem is we have so many excuses. We say the message of God's too difficult. It's, it's not relevant. The culture's not interested. It's not politically correct. God's message this gospel presentation that's for pastors and evangelists i just can't find time god why should i do it in all of those things we have a jonah like attitude to the mission that god's called us to as a church what jonah decided to do in his running was to then go to sleep his sleep was a sleep of rebellion and I'm telling you today that the world stumbles hopelessly in darkness 
until people like Jonah, who are called by God, wake up from their slumber of rebellion and they fulfill God's calling to share the message of life. I really believe that the church has got to be called to wake up and speak up. That we can't escape that. We've lulled ourselves to sleep with good worship. I'm not against worship. But if all we do is worship and we never go out and share the gospel, something's off. We've lulled ourselves to sleep by telling ourselves we've been successful for God's behalf and the buildings that we've built, the things that we've done. But if the, if the gospel's not being preached and lives are not being transformed, what is God interested in? The death, burial, and resurrection, the proclamation of the gospel, the only thing that transforms lives. We do not want to build a religious network. <laughs> we don't want to be successful religiously speaking. We want to be obedient to the very thing that changes lives, and that's the message of Jesus Christ. I don't want to sleep. Several years ago, just a couple years ago, two years ago, there was a jewelry heist from a Brinks armored tractor trailer. The contents that were taken out of the trailer were valued at over $100 million, thought to be the largest U.S. heist in history. This particular tractor trailer was on its way to a Jules Gym show in Pasadena, California. Two men were in the truck responsible for the jewels. They pulled up to a Flying J rest stop 70 miles from Los Angeles. And one guard got out, went into the 24-hour restaurant to eat. He was gone 27 minutes. And when he returned, the other guard was found fast asleep. They realized they had been robbed, and he said, I heard nothing, saw nothing. Sound asleep on the job. The jewelry company accused this iconic private security company, Brinks, of being grossly negligent. It's an intriguing story. And the only thing they had to say is one was eating and one was sleeping, and they weren't doing their jobs. I wonder if the Lord will say to us, you are grossly negligent because you're asleep like Jonah. I don't want to sleep like Jonah. I don't want to miss what God has for me. If the church continues to flee and to sleep, it will lose its purpose and its way. It will lose its passion and its voice of life transformation. It will only be an organization for good, and it will fail to see lives transformed. And the voice of God will be silent. Jonah is a call to the church, and it's a relevant call to wake up. We have been empowered by the Holy Spirit for the purpose of proclaiming the message of Jesus. And if we are sleeping, we need God to do a work in our lives like he did Jonah's, a divine encounter, a large fish, large enough to swallow us up, send us to the deep, the depths of the ocean and the belly of a fish till we realize that our life is ebbing away and all we can do is call upon God to save us and send us back into his work. And I'm okay with that. Whatever it takes, God, do your work in us. Break us in order to send us. Is that a bad thing? Jonah is so relevant. Reason number two is to understand the work of God. That is, to understand how God works. If we know anything from the Scriptures is this, from the very beginning all the way to Revelation to the end, is that we know God is on mission. And whatever it is He's doing, and we learn that from His Word by the Holy Spirit revealing to us that truth and what we're called and what we are to do, He is on a mission, and He invites us to be a part of that. And so what happens is, as he is accomplishing his will in the world, he invites us to be a part. And if we get over here on the side and we say, well, God, won't you do this? God says, no, this is what I'm doing. But God, I think this is better. It's not better. How in the world can you think that we, that you or I may know better than what God is doing? Peter tried that. It didn't work for him. 
He said, there's a better way. You don't have to go to the cross and die. You don't, no, 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 there's an alternative route. No, Peter, get behind me, Satan, for you do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of the world and of the enemy. And that's not what God, so we can't advise God. He has a plan. He knows what he is doing. We get to know him relationally. And as we know him relationally, what happens is he invites you and I to be a part of what he is doing. That's called communication. That's called prayer and his word. And as he reveals himself to us, at that moment he communicates with us, you and I, time and time and time again. Every time he speaks, we have a crisis of belief. And we can either hear him clearly and we can choose to obey, adjust our lives, walk by faith, not by fear, And then in that obedience, then we get on track with God and and get to be a part of what he's doing. Anything else outside of that is rebellion. Anything else outside of that is selfishness. And that's not how we are to live. God is on mission. God has a message. It's a message of redemption. And And it occurs when we speak his truth that confronts sin. And God uses unique methods. God chose Jonah. God chose me. God chooses you. He chooses you. He chooses human ambassadors. There's no way around it. He works in unique ways. What other things does he choose? He chose a storm. He chose a sailor, some sailors, a well. The sun, a worm, and a plant. That's just to name a few out of the book. He used all those things to get the truth to the Assyrians? Yes. See, God works in unique ways. But what what we must understand about that is it's his ways, not ours. And we're invited in. And if we can overcome our crisis of belief and we trust him by faith and not by fear, we get to be a part. The third reason I want to give you that we should study the book of Jonah is to learn to value the word of God. We looked right here at verse 1. It says, the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai. Do you know how significant that is? God spoke to Jonah. Sometimes we may get an email or a text or some kind of communication from somebody that's special to us and we open it up and we read, oh man, I was waiting to hear from that person. And we're so excited about that. That's from human being to human being, something that's special to us. But how special is it when God speaks to us? Have we lost that? Have we lost the the value of God from his word speaking to us? What a great treasure to hear God speak. When was the last time God showed you something from his word? When was the last time you can say, God showed me, God spoke to me by his spirit and by his word? In fact, not only did he speak to me, he has now asked me to speak for him. How important is that? What a privilege, what an honor to do that. But not everybody gets that excited about that. We don't fully believe that. We don't even believe that to read the Bible is worth our time too often. We see the word more of a burden than a blessing. We're not sure how to to hear God anymore. And could it be that we're too busy? Our minds are too full and our hearts are too broken with the things of the world that we don't even, we can't even discern the voice of God anymore. Oh, let the word of God speak. To those who are not running but who are surrendered. The value of the word of God is reason number three. We should study the book of Jonah. And reason number four is to accept, listen to this, is to learn to accept the discipline of God. One of the the evidences of genuine salvation that we know God is that he loves us enough to discipline us. Hebrews 12, 6 tells us that God chastens those that he loves. He'll chasten the church. He'll chasten Jonah. He'll chasten you and me. I've been chased before, and God's got a hold of me, and he's broken me and convicted me of sin. 
And at the end of it, I say, thank you, Lord, for loving me enough to come after me. I'm so grateful to be disciplined by God. Our fears, our rebellion, our prejudice, our lack of faith and knowing that God knows best. The whole package of personal brokenness in the presence of Almighty God is what we need. We should welcome it and embrace it with open arms. Until we come to the point we say, God, your way is the only way to live. Not the way I want to live. It is a picture of full surrender, and we watch it graphically played out in Jonah's life. And it'd be my prayer, if any of us are far from God and rebellion and running from God, and God chases us through the process of studying the book of Jonah, every verse looked at, every hour spent in preparation, every minute spent in proclamation will be worth it if anyone returns to God in brokenness and obedience. It's amazing that God doesn't give up on us, but he pursues us in our rebellion to restore us to serve. He lovingly confronts our rebellious running, our bad habits, our sour pouting. When we don't get our way, he still loves us. So reason number four is to accept the discipline of God. And here's reason number five is to trust the direction of God. We've got to learn to trust God because God to you and I most often, listen to this, doesn't make sense to us. I I, I can't even begin to tell you. It's just not logical the way God works. I I have to come back and say, I'll tell something, Michelle. So Michelle, it just doesn't make sense. We talk about it, and then I go, of course it doesn't. It's God. That's how God works. It doesn't make sense to us. We say things like this. What do you mean, God? How can this be, God? Surely you don't mean it, God. Assyria, they're too wicked. They're too big. They won't listen to me. I'm surely going to fail, God. And we get into the no routine, and we say, no, God, no. No, no, no. God, I know you're God, but you obviously do not know what you are talking about. Have you ever talked to God like that? That's what Jonah did. And there's a little bit of Jonah and sometimes a lot of Jonah in all of us, let's be honest. We don't look at it and say, God, you don't know what you're doing. Now, we may not say it that directly, but when we go, no, God, and we go this way, and he's going that way, what we're saying is, God, I don't trust you, and you don't know best. I think I'm going to go this way as fast as I can. That's really what we're saying. Almighty God, that we would say that to him. We put the pedal down hard and fast, for we must run from God as far as we can. I can't trust him anymore is really what we're saying. Now, we'll get in depth and look at why Jonah felt that way. He had a lot of good logical reasons. Assyria was one of their greatest enemies, horrific people. Hard to understand that God would even want him to go in there. I mean, this the whole deal. We'll look at it. But let me simply say this to you. We should stop and look at ourselves, and we should tell ourselves, if God can save me, he can save anyone. Isn't that true? Who will God ask you to take the message to that you just say, well, they're not going to accept it, or they're too evil to accept it, or why would God even care about them? One of the great beauties of this whole study of Jonah is the incredible love of God for his creation, even those that are incredibly wicked and evil. And wasn't that our state? God will save all that will come to him and believe in him for salvation. Those are the five reasons. They're good reasons. They're solid reasons. They're motivational reasons. It should draw us in and change us in our understanding of God. So why should we study Jonah? I believe we should study as a church because it is our tendency to want God to be safe. We don't really want a God that speaks to us, sends us to speak for him. You and I need this study because we are inclined to run and to sleep in rebellion. 
Jonah was given a message to preach. You and I have been given a message to preach. Jonah was running from God. Christians today in many ways are running from God. Jonah was sleeping. Christians today are sleeping. The church needs to wake up to the message that has been entrusted to us. Jonah learned the value of the discipline of God, and we must do the same. And Jonah learned that we must learn that God loves all people. Listen, (laughs) even your enemies. He loves them. Even my enemies, even Jonah's enemies, God loves them. Franklin Graham, Billy Graham's son, who is now overseeing his ministry and his passing, was a man that could share testimony and has many times a clear testimony of what it means to run from God. He said, I believed in God. I just didn't want Jesus running my life. I wanted to run my own life. And let me tell you something. That's not too far off base where all of us live. He said, but I was miserable. As a teen, Franklin was sent to an alternative school in New York. He was later kicked out from smoking, drinking, and defying authority was his norm. He said, I took pride in my individuality, and I tried to see how far I could stretch the rules before getting reprimanded. Instead of getting my esteem from achieving within the system, I got my thrills and identity from challenging the system. The more I tried to fill my life with things I thought would make me happy, the more empty I felt inside. Despite his father Billy Graham's dedication to a life of ministry, Franklin knew that wouldn't get him into heaven. He said, I knew that, I knew that, but I I was in rebellion. I was running from God. He said, eventually I got so tired of running from God, I gave my life to Christ at the age of 22. He said, this is how it happened. He said, I realized my sin. Then suddenly, I had an overpowering conviction that I needed to get my life right with God. I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. My years of running and rebellion had ended. It was finished. He surrendered his life to Christ. Now that's for salvation, but even for those who know the Lord, we run from him in the same way like Jonah did. And until we get sick and tired of being empty and running from God and we see that the running is sin, we cannot know the fullness of trusting God. Does that mean that Franklin Graham's life was easy from that point forward? No. But it was by faith. He's trusting God today, every day of his life, with no regrets. Is it hard? Yes. Is it challenging? Absolutely. But the fulfillment And to be right with God, you can't put a price on that. That's why we should learn from Jonah as well. Jonah will teach us how to hear the voice of God. We need this. Jonah will teach us how to delight in obeying God. We need this. Jonah will teach us how to experience personal revival with God. Man, how we need this. Jonah will teach us how to minister to the forgotten. We need this. He will teach us, Jonah will, how to face our foes. We need this. He will teach us how to face our fears of God. And we need this.